Okay, so let's all settle down. While we're all settling down, I, I want to make a formal apology to my colleague John Barros. Uh, I can't actually, I can't uh, uh, myself understand how I could have forgotten about bacterial conjugation yesterday. Uh, to make sure that I remembered it, I found a couple of videos on YouTube. Uh, it's definitely there. Uh, I'm not going to show them, but uh, I don't know what came over me yesterday. It must have been a streak of conservatism or something yeah, we like that. On a committee together. I know, isn't that amazing? Well, we never actually discussed bacterial lateral gene transfer very much, but uh, yeah, it's definitely there. And then also they sort of pop open and let all their genes out sometimes as well, don't they? And then I, don't, I want to hear about the third approach over dinner. Yeah, well, so. it's actually, how many of you are interested in horizontal gene transfer and the origins in early life? I'm interested in the first part of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, I would like to fit in a lecture on viruses and horizontal gene transfer and how I think we could not have actually had life without horizontal gene transfer. Mm -hmm. and so it gives you something to think about right now. So sex in the microbial world came very, very early on. Good. Okay. Well, then that bodes well for interesting life uh, in other parts of the galaxy. Exactly. Ab yeah. Absolutely. Okay. We should, we should have some new names for that. Okay. Over dinner. So where are we right now? Uh, with respect to my lectures, um, we're going to talk today about the Hadean Earth. Um, now. In a sense, I feel like I've been chasing after Jim Casting, who's been leaping ahead of me in time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've almost caught up to him. And then we're going to kind of diverge, because from this point on, I'm going to leave the Earth and talk about uh, other worlds in the solar system and then extrasolar planets uh, after today. Although it's possible we might find each other again on Mars. We'll see. We have to talk at dinner about that. Divide up the planet Mars. <laughs> So today, um, I want to continue, uh, this afternoon I should say, I'll continue the discussion about the origin of the Earth that uh, I began this morning. And uh, in particular, just say a few words about uh, the time scale for formation of the Earth. How well do we really know how long it took the Earth to form? I want to then talk about impacts uh, and uh, the Hadean Earth. I'm not going to talk about the faint early sun, which was a key aspect of that time because Jim has covered it very well. So you should put these two aspects together. And then I want to finish the discussion of the delivery of volatiles. We talked about water this morning by talking a little bit about the delivery and survival of organic molecules on the Hadean Earth. Uh, this is a... Um, a sketch of key events in the Hadean, uh, put together actually by Halliday in 2003. It's a little bit different now, but really not very, very much. And um, there are some tie points here in time. Uh, there is, of course, a kind of a, a, a zero point at which uh, the Sun and the protoplanetary disk form. We talked about that yesterday. Um, not too long after that, tens of millions of years, uh, some differentiated asteroids uh, were present. Uh, the accretion of Mars, uh, based on isotopic data I'll mention in a little bit, uh, could in fact have been completed within um, a few million years of the appearance of the first solids, the calcium-aluminum-rich uh, uh, inclusions. And of course here, based on the discussion that we had this morning about planetary embryos, it's important to recognize that Mars itself may simply be a body that didn't participate in the final stages of the assembly of the terrestrial planets. In other words, that Mars itself is an example of an embryo that became isolated and just didn't grow significantly beyond that point whereas the Earth and Venus uh, obviously grew quite a lot because the Earth and Venus are both 10 times larger than Mars, uh, 100 times larger than the Earth's moon. So um, if this data point is correct, uh, it gives us a very nice indication of when these very large embryos uh, were actually completed. And that would be in a time scale of, of 10 million years after the appearance of the first solids. 
Um, the moon is very accurately dated to have formed sometime during the mid to late stages of the Earth's accretion. Uh, it may have, in fact, been the last of the very large impacts uh, of Mars, moon and Mars-sized bodies. Uh, and uh, then there's other data. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but uh, the Earth would have acquired uh, an early on an atmosphere partly from uh, the protoplanetary disk itself and partly from uh, these objects that uh, struck it and uh, were part of its growth early on. Uh, that material would have been lost. And then outgassing uh, would have led to the formation of, um, uh, of a new atmosphere essentially where uh, essentially most of the um, evidence for the protoplanetary nebula was essentially gone. The Earth just did not retain uh, based on uh, ratios of things like noble gases and so on uh, very much of its uh, early atmosphere that would have been in contact with any remnant gas, uh, the protoplanetary disk. So Earth accretion, core formation and degassing um, would have been completed certainly within the first hundred million years of uh, the uh, appearance of the first solids, uh, possibly earlier than that, but certainly within the first hundred million years. But Jonathan, this, this is kind of interesting to me. This would imply that the Earth degassed really rapidly. Yes. And what would that, what kind of atmosphere would that be? Would that, you and Nesbitt in a paper many years ago said if it degassed really rapidly and accumulated the CO2 and even water vapor that high, you might have actually had your first rains mm -hmm. at 200 degrees Celsius. Yeah, example. it's well, certainly um, the Earth during accretion would have had a steam, a steam atmosphere, which is an atmosphere that was dominated by water that then would have rained out onto the surface. And uh, uh, so that's the kind of picture that actually has been worked on by um, at least one group in Japan in great detail is the, the nature of those types of atmospheres. But the, I mean, the crust itself for some period of time would have been molten also. And uh, so you would have had essentially repeated cycles of, of outgassing and reabsorption and outgassing of this material. Okay. Um, a little bit higher fidelity look at the, the first 50 million years or 60 million years of this um, chronology is shown here. And uh, so this is tied to the earliest form solid material, the calcium aluminum refractory inclusions, which look like this. Uh, they have a chemistry that requires that they had formed at high temperature, about 2,000 Kelvin. Um, they predate, based on radioisotopic dating, um, what, are, uh, what were thought to be, for a while, the oldest solids in the solar system, chondrules, which are embedded, you can see here, in carbonaceous chondrites. Um, so this is a meteorite sample. Here is a, a human thumb or a human forefinger or something like that um, for size. This is the calcium aluminum rich inclusion. Uh, these are the chondrules in here and then the matrix in the background. Um, exactly how CAIs formed and were incorporated, incorporated in the matrix is still uh, something of, uh, of a debate, but their ages are pretty well determined. Okay, so um, one can date the formation of Mars based on the time when the metal and the rock separated. I'll say a little bit more about that. That was quite early on, again, the first few million years after the appearance of the CAIs. Uh, chondrule formation uh, then, uh, as I mentioned, postdates uh, the CAIs. It's possible uh, that core formation on Mars actually was delayed beyond the end of the time uh, that Mars formed, although uh, this is a kind of a debate that, that is um, uh, not very, very well, how shall I put it, not very well anchored to, to data at the moment, but there is an ongoing debate as to when uh, Mars actually did differentiate. I'm not going to talk about that in, in this lecture. And then estimates for the age of the Earth range between uh, 10 and 15, probably more generously, out to 20 million years. Um, 
one of the interesting questions, of course, is where do you peg this point, which is quote unquote the earliest form solids, relative to the time that a protoplanetary disk, a gaseous disk, was actually in place uh, and um, transporting matter inward and angular momentum outward. That's actually a difficult problem and again it may be that we will have to rely on, on indirect evidence such as what I discussed this morning, uh, the age of Iapetus where Iapetus itself, uh, if you believe the model that we put together, formed about three million years after the formation of the CAIs. Uh, Iapetus evidently formed in orbit around Saturn as Saturn itself was forming because satellite accretion is a very rapid process. And so what that says is that at the time the CA CAIs formed, the disk was still present and it was still present for another several million years after that, which certainly makes sense. Um, but there are few other tie points that one can make between the gaseous component of the disk and the solids. Um, the earliest age of the moon is about 30 million years after the uh, formation of the CAIs, uh, again based on isotopic evidence. Um, a more uh, generally accepted range of uh, ages for the moon is between 40 and 50 million years, but the point is that uh, this is well within the 100 million years that we might consider the Earth to have been in a state of growth and, and accretion. And it may be that the moon forming impact was the last one to add material. Uh, it's certainly hard to uh, imagine a situation where a large impact would have occurred after the formation of the moon and the moon would still have been preserved. So the existence of the moon uh, and its age probably give a good hint as to when the last of the lunar to Mars sized impacts occurred, although certainly smaller bodies, uh, smaller in quotes, uh, impacted the moon thereafter. So um, much of this record is based on uh, dating of rocks by uh, looking at uh, radioisotopes, radioactive isotopes, uh, the parent isotopes and the daughter isotopes. And I've listed uh, some of these parent-daughter uh, pairs here. Uh, the parent is the isotope that's radioactive and uh, is decaying by one of several processes, beta decay, alpha decay, fission, etc. Um, the daughter is the product of that decay, and this is the standard usage in the literature. And then shown here is the half-life, which crudely speaking is the time it takes for half of a large sample of the parent radioactive isotope to decay to the daughter. And uh, these are in years, so what you can see is that uh, for the pairs that I've listed here, there's quite a range from Sumerium neodymium, uh, which in fact has a half-life uh, that's greater than Hubble time, uh, likewise for rubidium strontium, uh, down to uh, hafnium tungsten, which has a half-life of about um, nine million years. Uh, I haven't listed uh, the aluminum-26 magnesium, which has a half-life just shy of a million years, and the iron-60 uh, decay uh, as well, but this, this is only a partial list. These are the isotopes that are particularly useful in dating events both uh, in solid bodies in the solar system and even dating cosmic events like the time that the first elements uh, began forming in large amounts in the galaxy, the first heavy elements. Um, because these are elements that uh, are moderately abundant, they exist in, in rock in different phases. They will separate out into different minerals or the parent will prefer to be in the silicates and the daughter will prefer to be in the metals, vice versa. Uh, as I'll now explain, these are very useful in trying to understand different processes that occur as um, uh, rocks solidify either from a melt or even uh, from the vapor phase. Uh, both during the formation of these bodies and also uh, much later by uh, solidification in, in volcanic lavas and so on. Okay, so the radioactive decay process can be expressed very simply this way. The number of parent atoms uh, at a particular time, T, 
is given by the initial number of parent atoms times e to the minus rt, uh, where r is 1 over the average lifetime of the radioactive atom. Uh, the average lifetime is not the half-life. It's related to the half-life by a constant of order unity. Um, but uh, this is the basic equation, and uh, it simply says that the rate of change with time of a particular radioactive species depends upon uh, the number of that species with a minus sign. Uh, and um, then this particular uh, function, either the average lifetime or the half-life, which can be measured uh, quite accurately in the lab. So typically, um, it's difficult to simply take an equation like this and use it because if you're looking at uh, pairs of parents and daughters, for example, let's take rubidium and strontium, which have a half-life here of uh, 5 times 10 to the 10 years. Uh, the problem, of, of course, is that you don't actually have a closed system when you look at these pairs of isotopes. So a closed system would be uh, a situation where I had a box around a large number of the rubidium that's decaying to strontium. I know that there was no initial daughter product in the system, no strontium uh, present, no strontium-87, uh, and that there's been no migration of these isotopes according to their particular chemical affinities for being in particular mineral phases. Because obviously, rubidium is a different element from strontium and will tend to uh, associate with different minerals, will tend to migrate uh, certainly in melts uh, in, in the rock. So it's actually difficult then uh, to use the simple equation and one has to play different kinds of tricks for different um, pairs of parent-daughter products. In the case of rubidium and strontium, uh, there is a stable isotope of strontium, strontium-86, and it's possible to rewrite this equation uh, by uh, writing uh, not only the number of parent atoms, but the number of daughter atoms as well, and then normalizing everything by the stable isotope, strontium-86. And the decay equation then looks like this if you do that transformation. 87 strontium at present divided by um, the um, stable isotope of strontium is that uh, is strontium-87 at the beginning, plus the amount of rubidium-87, and then we have this uh, exponential t over the half-life times 1.4 minus 1. Because strontium-87 uh, is chemically like strontium-86, you will tend to find them in the same mineral phases, whereas rubidium-87, rubidium is not like strontium. So where you find strontium-87 in phases where rubidium should have been, you know there's been a decay that's occurred. Uh, and the rubidium has been transformed in place into the strontium. Uh, also, when you write the equation like this, you essentially have, you do have the equation of a straight line in which the measured value of strontium-87 to strontium-86 today divided, uh, plotted against the measured value of rubidium-87 to strontium-86 at present uh, in a sample of a large number of grains that all have the same age should give you a straight line according to that equation. And the y-intercept of that straight line is the strontium 87 to 86 ratio at time zero. That is, it's the amount of strontium 87 that was present um, in the rock uh, uh, at the time that this actually solidified to form um, a, uh, a solid rock, a solid uh, mineral assemblage. The older the, the age of the rock, the longer ago the rock solidified, the steeper the slope. Uh, the younger the age, the less steep the slope. And the goodness of fit of this straight line gives you an indication of how much chemical or thermal modification has occurred in the sample. And typically, um, if the experiments are done right, uh, one gets a very, very good concordance, a very, very tight relationship with a straight line for primitive meteorites, the chondrites, where uh, essentially no melting has occurred 
if you take, of course, um, a part of the chondrites, the matrix, for example, or date the chondrules separately, or date the CAIs, and so on. So this is an example, actually, from quite 25 years ago, of a number of chondrite samples that um, all fall on the same line, actually with a little bit better accuracy than this, so 4.565 billion years ago. Again, this is strontium-87 divided by strontium-86 found in the grain, divided by the rubidium-87 to strontium-86 found in the grain. Uh, and and this is, uh, these are the data uh, where the error bars are actually much smaller than the, uh, the data points themselves. And so where you have good samples, uh, the age dating can be very, very precise. Of course, dating rocks on Earth uh, that have undergone multiple episodes of melting and resolidification and so on, uh, the data don't look as good as this. They're often very, very messy and can give <coughs> ambiguous ages. But for the chondrites, these ages are very good. And for that reason, um, geochemists will say, we know the age of the oldest solids in the solar system very, very, very well. Okay, so um, rubidium strontium is only one uh, radioisotopic system. There are a number of others, and this is um, a kind of a little plot. We used to call this a Caltech plot a long time ago. I, I think that's unfair. A Caltech plot, because that's where I got my degree, is a plot of uh, something against nothing. And it seemed that this was very popular for some reason in, in geological and planetary science at Caltech. But since then, I've been told that this is done at many other institute, fine institutions. So uh, maybe the name is a misnomer. Uh, but anyway, here you see a collection of ages for things like the chondrules uh, of different uh, chemical types, uh, CAIs, where these uh, now you can see are a little bit older than the chondrules, um, and uh, as well ages for uh, chondritic uh, com components of chondritic meteorites using different systems, including those based on uh, the hafnium tungsten system. Being able to calibrate the um, amount of hafnium and tungsten in carbonaceous chondrites at the time that those rocks formed is actually very nice because this particular radioisotopic system, which has a short half-life of nine million years, uh, involves a parent hafnium, which uh, prefers to remain in the, in the silicate minerals. Uh, the daughter, tungsten, tends to associate with the metals. It's siderophilic, um, as opposed to being lithophilic. And so you can imagine that at the time that core formation in a planet occurs, and core formation here, I'm simply referring to, because we're talking about rocky planets, as the separation between the iron and the silicate phases, so that the iron, which is denser by a factor of two than the silicates, separates out to the center of the body. In the case of the Earth, this certainly happened during accretion, relatively early in the accretion process. Again, for Mars, there's some debate about when it occurred, but Mars is 10 times smaller than the Earth, so it didn't get as hot during accretion. Um, so the hafnium stays in the mantle of the, of the Earth, which is uh, silicate. The tungsten goes into the core. The hafnium that's left behind decays to tungsten with a half-life of nine million years. And so what you end up with is tungsten in the mantle of the Earth that shouldn't be there. It should be in the core. And if you, if you can measure that and you know the original ratios of these in the primitive bodies that have a definite age date based on isotopic pairs that have longer half-lives, like rubidium-strontium, or in this case, lead-lead systems, then you can actually determine the, the interval of time between the appearance of the first solids and the formation of the core of the Earth, which one can assert gives you a significant fraction of the accretion time of the Earth within a factor of a few. So these numbers, uh, so this type of argument is what gives you a, a, a time scale of between, let's say, 10 and 30 million years for the formation of the Earth or the formation of a significant fraction of the mass of the Earth. If indeed the, the moon formed in a large impact, uh, one could also say that dating the age of the moon 
uh, gives you kind of the end uh, of the accretion process uh, because it's the last large impact. So the, the formation of the Earth is pretty well constrained. I wanted to go through this in some detail uh, because I wanted um, to make sure that it was clear to everybody that these are pretty well pinned down dates. Okay, so that's just the same slide as before. Um, now again, the, the origin of the moon is, um, and the history of the moon, uh, is well determined from absolute dating through radioisotopic pairs of lunar rocks. And um, I actually lost track. When am I supposed to stop? Because I, I am not counting down, I'm counting up here. So, let's see. It's a quarter to seven. Okay, quarter to seven. So I want to stop actually at uh, 740, basically, uh, 640. Yes, 740. 640, sorry. All right. Um, I'm showing you this picture now because we're going to talk about the impact record on the moon. And so this is an image from uh, an operating spacecraft in orbit around the moon now, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, the principal investigator for the cameras at Arizona State University. It's a NASA mission. And um, very in the last, I would say, five or ten years, Spacecraft orbiting other planets have uh, had imaging systems that are good enough that they're able to photograph spacecraft that have landed on the surface of those bodies. In two cases, one is the Moon and the other is Mars. In fact, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, if you remember, actually caught an image of the Phoenix uh, Polar Lander in flight under its parachute as it was descending down for a landing, which has got to be one of the most amazing pictures of the space program, uh, possibly one of the great pictures of the, of the um, well, not quite the 20th, 20th century, but the last 50 years, let's say. Um, and if you want to see that picture, you haven't seen it, I'll show it to you on my computer. Um, this picture well illustrates the fact that the moon has craters and yes, Virginia, we have landed people on the moon and they have walked around, put stuff on the moon, gone and collected stuff from their little robots that died years before and brought back hundreds of pounds of moon rocks. Um, you don't know how many students in my non-science, freshman, sophomore, undergraduate, natural science classes have been convinced by TV shows that humans did not land on the moon. And I have to say, and I apologize for saying this because I wasn't going to, that I also know of at least one aerospace engineer from Alania who also doubts that humans landed on the moon because he can't figure out how it would be done. He said it was too dangerous. Okay, Caspita. So anyway, there it is. Yes, these could all be faked, but the moon rocks are not fake. And they contain absolute age dates. They contain geochemistry uh, that is important uh, because that geochemistry tells us several things. Uh, first of all, the geochemical data from the moon tells us that the moon basically is identical in, in most respects with one important difference uh, to that of the Earth's mantle. So the chemistry of the Earth's mantle, and in particular, the, the stable isotopes of oxygen, this is a, a measure of oxygen 17 to oxygen 16 plotted against oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. All three of these are stable isotopes. They don't decay. So their variation is associated with mass separation processes. The upper mantle of the Earth, which has been the oxygen isotope ratio for the quote-unquote primitive upper mantle of the Earth, which is determined uh, by sampling uh, certain kinds of minerals that are obtained from the upper mantle. And the moon both lie in this little oval that you see here, this little green, this little black oval that's under the green dot. Whereas the oxygen isotopic ratio for different kinds of meteorites, uh, the carbonaceous type ordinaries uh, are up here, different types of carbonaceous chondrites are here, the Martian meteorites are displaced up here and so on. They're all off of that line. The enstatite chondrites are on the same line, but they're displaced a little bit. This correspondence between the rocks that are found on the moon and the rocks that are found on the Earth in terms of the oxygen isotopic ratios and other geochemical uh, measures strongly suggests that the moon is a product of the Earth's mantle. 
from very early on. Now what the moon lacks is number one, a lot of iron. It has some iron but not very much and that's consistent with largely being a piece of the Earth's mantle. And it also lacks certain volatile elements, in fact most volatile elements. Uh, not talking here about water but we're talking even about potassium, that level of volatility. And so what the moon looks like is a piece of the Earth's mantle that has been removed, heated to very high temperatures so that the more volatile elements have been vaporized away and then uh, cooled down and reassembled. And so, of course, this was recognized only a few years after the Apollo missions in the early, uh, the mid-1970s. And so the idea that the moon was a product of a large impact uh, arose during that time. It's one of the great <laughs> insights of planetary science. Uh, the problem has always been how do you make that happen? And here's um, a, a relatively recent simulation. Uh, you can't see the X and Y axes very well, but the temperature is shown, the, the colors that are shown here are temperature. And so uh, 5,000 degrees Kelvin is the yellow here. Uh, 2,500 Kelvin is the sort of middle blue. Uh, the red tops out at about 7,000 Kelvin, which is above the surface temperature of the sun, the photospheric temperature of the sun. Um, this is just projections in the X and Y plane. Here's a body the size of the Earth. This is an object um, a little bit larger than Mars and it's hitting the Earth obliquely. So it's coming in, not with a direct impact, but coming in obliquely in such a way that it carves out a big chunk of the Earth's mantle. These are times, by the way. These times are not very visible either, but we're talking here about hours and uh, essentially a day to finish all this off. Uh, a large chunk of material gets spalled off of the Earth and then because of the angle of impact uh, and the way that this cloud of material expands, there's actually a second impact of this debris on the Earth. And that second impact is one way, there are a couple of ways, to get a fraction of this material to go into orbit around the Earth. Because if you want to form the Moon, it has to go into orbit. And if you don't have rocket engines on this debris, it's very hard to do that without some kind of dissipative process that re either removes the angular momentum uh, with a direct impact it all basically leaves um, or provides enough angular momentum, either way, depending on how you look at it. So uh, the second impact is shown here. And then to finish things off, uh, one gets, uh, the Earth has now gotten really, really hot and very nasty and um, you know, essentially has lost any atmosphere that it had at that point and has to re-outgas. Material is now spiraling around. Uh, there's a spiral arm that forms this disk. Uh, the Earth begins to cool down after some period of, of weeks and you end up with a disk of material that eventually coalesces to form the Moon. So computer simulations show that this can be done the geochemical evidence suggests that it has happened. And the dating of the moon at 4.5, whatever, about a few hundred million years after the, um, the appearance of the first solids, 100 million years after the appearance of the first solids, kind of gives an end point to the accretional history of the Earth. <laughs> and if you will, in a sense, the beginning of the Hadean, because at that point, there were no more large impacts and the surface could solidify and, um, and, and one could then have liquid water. So 4.5 billion years. Um, the impact crater density on the moon then provides an absolute chronology for impact rates. And uh, those impact rates then are shown here. This is billions of years before present and the age of the moon is somewhere up in here. Okay, this probably is um, a little bit too young. It should be over in here. Um, the oldest whole rock samples on the Earth come out about four billion years. Uh, zircons, um, certain uh, minerals from deep in the crust or the mantle are a bit older than that. And um, the cratering rate, this is in arbitrary units just so it can be displayed, uh, you can see comes down from some arbitrarily very large value uh, tied in by the crater density at different places on the moon uh, and then essentially uh, by counting small craters that are not labeled here you can uh, 
not only uh, see that things seem to level out to the present, but there's actually a little bit of a hump about a billion years ago that's not terribly well understood. Uh, and again, this is obtained by looking at different areas on the moon. The lunar highlands are the most ancient. They're the most heavily cratered. Uh, the mare, which are the areas where lava float out onto the moon's surface uh, a few hundred million years after formation, uh, again, can be absolutely dated because uh, there are rocks available from there. So the lava flows on Mare Tranquilitatis and Oceanus Procellarum uh, are very, very well dated here at uh, three, three and a half billion years ago. The question is, is this rate of decline of the impacts, uh, the rate of impacts with time, is this coming down from some arbitrarily large value uh, that was present during accretion? Or is it, in fact, coming down from a peak that occurred a distinct number of hundreds of millions of years after accretion? Well, there are a couple of different lines of evidence that, in fact, uh, what one is seeing here is not the decline from the primordial uh, accretion rate, but the decline from an epoch of very, very heavy bombardment called the late heavy bombardment, uh, which certainly had a profound effect on the surfaces of at least the moon and the earth and Mercury, where there's evidence for it as well. And maybe throughout the whole solar system, but we don't really know. Um, the late heavy bombardment uh, is argued on the basis of a number of lines of evidence. This is actually not a terribly good plot. I was unable to find a better one. But this is age dating of impact melts in lunar rocks. This is uh, Barb Cohen et al. Uh, this is occurrence rate versus age in billions of years. And the oldest peak in these impact melts, and the one that's actually most widespread, although it's hard to see in this plot, is at about 3.8 or 3.9 billion years ago. Um, it's hard, of course, to get the late heavy bombardment peak by counting craters themselves because the crater density is so large in the lunar highlands, but that has been tried and that's another weak line of evidence. And then there are other interesting kinds of evidence, such as this uh, in a paper by Jorgensen and colleagues, uh, looking at uh, samples of very, very old rocks, metasedimentary rocks in Iswa, in Greenland, showing evidence uh, of enrichments in iridium compared to present-day ocean crust that they interpret to be uh, evidence of the late heavy bombardment. And they also then argue that the, the enrichments uh, would, it's not shown in this abstract, the enrichments must be from cometary material rather than asteroidal material. That, that may be a stretch, but it's interesting uh, that one can at least interpret iridium abundances uh, in terms of a late heavy bombardment. Now, why you can't interpret this in terms of volcanic effects is not really clear to me. But in any event, uh, this is a paper published a year or so ago in Icarus. So what caused the late heavy bombardment? In a way, it's counterintuitive because one would expect that the sweep up of smaller debris after accretion by the large bodies that grew from that process of accretion uh, should be one in which there's a progressively smaller and smaller amount of material. If you have a fixed amount of material, uh, a fixed amount of sand, and you're standing, and you're standing in the middle of this sandstorm and you're sticky, uh, and the sand is blowing by you, gradually you would expect that you would pick up more and more of the sand and there'd be less and less available uh, to be blown around. Uh, the late heavy bombardment, if in fact it's a, it's a real event, and it seems more and more that it is a, a real event, there is evidence for it, says that there was, at least in one part of the solar system, an event that occurred well after the formation of the solar system that generated either a lot of additional debris or caused debris that was present in some orbits to be scattered into other orbits which had already been cleared of material. So it says one of those two things. Now the most interesting and probably the most elegant explanation for the late heavy bombardment uh, is that um, of what's now called the Nice model because the, the group that led, in fact, Morbidelli, the, the um, uh, who essentially, I guess, was the lead in this, although he was not the lead author, 
uh, works at the observatory at the Côte d'Azur in Nice. Uh, the first paper uh, to describe this model completely was by Gomez et al. Uh, there have been papers since then, and actually the model is, has been revised substantially since 2005 uh, when it was first published. In fact, uh, tell me your first name again. Yes. Maran, uh, who's here at the, the school, uh, works on aspects of the, of the Nice model. And we, he was talking to me about this at the coffee break. So what the Nice model essentially says is that, in its simplest form, is that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune did not start out in the orbits that they are in today. And in fact, Jupiter and Saturn began with the relationship between their orbital periods uh, which today is a relationship where Saturn has an orbital period more than twice the orbital period of, of Jupiter. It's 30 years for Saturn versus 12 years, I think, for Jupiter. They started out with a relationship between their orbital periods which was less than two to one, which means they were closer together and in the course of moving to their current uh, orbital periods and therefore semi-major axes, uh, had to pass through the two to one mean motion resonance, the resonance uh, in which uh, the orbit period of Saturn is exactly twice that of Jupiter. Uh, and during that passage through the resonance, the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn became eccentric. And I'm actually hearing a radio, believe it or not. Do you hear that? No, it actually sounds like voices to me. Isn't that scary? <laughs> maybe, it's the, maybe it's the microphone. I still remember the scene from that great movie, This is Spinal Tap, where the band is on their last legs and they can only perform at some Air Force dance hall with nobody else around. As soon as they start performing with the audio microphones, they get interference from the air traffic control tower and the air traffic control instructions are broadcast through their microphones instead of their horrible rock music. So maybe that's what's happening here. Okay, anyway, be that as it may. Um, so Jupiter and Saturn pass through a two to one resonance and uh, the orbits become eccentric and you'll see a, a simulation of that in a moment. In the more recent models, there's actually um, a, a sort of an elaboration of this where uh, Jupiter and Saturn uh, begin uh, where uh, Jupiter and Saturn begin in the gaseous disk migrating inward. Uh, Saturn, of course, more rapidly than Jupiter. So this is semi-major axis and arbitrary units versus time normalized to their orbital periods at a semi-major axis of one. This is not one AU, this is arbitrary. But Saturn migrates more quickly because it's less massive than Jupiter. It falls into a two to three resonance with Jupiter. This is the part of the history when the gas is present where Jupiter is plowed through the asteroid belt, this um, uh, set of, of images that I showed you earlier. Um, and being in the, this two to three resonance, of course, that's smaller than the one to two resonance. Uh, and uh, as the gaseous disk goes away and they interact with the particulate disk, they then begin to evolve outward in such a way that they pass through this two to one Saturn to Jupiter resonance and the eccentricities get amplified. So this is one possible way that this encounter began. But uh, what's interesting about it is what happens to the debris that is outward of these orbits. So this is a simulation from the 2005 model. Here's the Sun, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They're all much more closely spaced than uh, they are today. This is the time. This is the equivalent of the Kuiper belt, but much more massive than it is today. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are dynamically interacting. They're close to, but not at the two to one resonance. And as they pass into that two to one resonance, just about here, uh, they get very eccentric, they perturb the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, uh, everything moves out to its present positions and uh, particles are scattered. So the particulate disk that these planets are interacting with uh, gets scattered everywhere and one of the consequences of this uh, is in their model this late heavy bombardment because a large flux of material 
ends up going inward toward the sun just as material also gets ejected. And the time scale for this is 800 million years, somewhat arbitrary in the initial model, but in this current model where they tie this to an earlier two to three resonant encounter, it's actually not quite so arbitrary. And it's consistent with the late heavy bombardment. So this is a, a series of snapshots. Uh, I think I've explained it already in the movie. Um, the main point is that if indeed this is something that was triggered by uh, this resonant encounter between Jupiter and Saturn, then it's particular to planetary systems where you have terrestrial planets inward of two giant planets, one of which is quite a bit more massive than the other giant planet. What would be interesting, of course, would be to take other planetary systems, imaginary or real, where there are multiple giant planets, and look at what these kinds of interactions would tend to do in those systems. Of course, the starting conditions are not very well constrained because, again, you have to know when these planets form relative to when the disk then dissipates. But nonetheless, it's evident from this type of uh, simulation that the outcomes can be very, very different from each other. So um, I'm going to talk about the delivery of organics actually tomorrow uh, because we're up at 640. But what I want to emphasize uh, in this part of the talk is that the, the, the dating of the Earth's age is very, very precise. It came after the formation of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, it came after the gas dissipated. Uh, the impact rates on the Earth and the Moon were very, very strongly amplified uh, about 3.9 or 4 billion years ago, uh, the late heavy bombardment. And it's plausible and somewhat compelling to argue that these rates jumped up, uh, were triggered by uh, the uh, resonant passage, the passage through the two, two to one resonance of Jupiter and Saturn. Now what that says for the history of the Earth is that you have to imagine the last truly catastrophic event was the formation of the moon by a giant impact because that melted the crust of the Earth. The Earth then solidified. Impact rates were relatively low after that. The first evidence for liquid water on the surface of the Earth is at about four billion years ago. Uh, and life could have formed at that point, but right around 4 billion or perhaps 3.9 billion years, the impactor flux goes way, way up uh, and um, potentially could have extinguished life. Although, as I'll argue tomorrow morning, there are some compelling uh, arguments against the late heavy bombardment as being a, a sterilizing process. But it would have delivered large amounts of additional organic material to the Earth. So the question then, and the one that we'll address tomorrow, is did the Earth acquire its organic material when it acquired its water, which would have been prior to the formation of the moon, or did it acquire it in the late heavy bombardment? That have, could have been a limiting factor for the formation of life. Because again, to recapitulate what I talked about this morning, if water came attached to silicates by chemisorption at one astronomical unit, there are no organic molecules that come with that. But if, on the other hand, the Earth acquired its water from carbonaceous chondrites or even these main belt comet parent bodies, uh, there could have been a lot of organic molecules brought into the Earth very, very early on. So we'll pick up on that tomorrow, and I'm happy to take uh, questions now for what looks like about five minutes. So thank you. Jim. John, uh, the oldest sedimentary rocks on Earth are roughly 3.9 or 4 billion years old, yep. which is the date you gave. But there are zircons, you know, zirconium silicate, right. that have, you do the oxygen isotopes on the cores of those zir zircons, yep. and they're different from the mantle oxygen isotopes. Yep. On, uh, and so that's a actually evidence for liquid water back to 4.4 billion years, according to. John Valley. Right. And actually the zircons were marked on that earlier chart, although they were marked at 4.3 rather than 4.4. Um, but yes, you're right. The, now the thing that I've always wondered about with the zircons is whether that actually tells you that there's liquid water on the surface 
or liquid water somewhere in the early crust or mantle of the earth. That is, how constraining is that for having liquid water actually on or exposed to the surface in the form of a hydrosphere? It, it's not real constraining. It just tells you that there, I think the temperature constraint is, has to be less than 250 Celsius. Right. Uh, yep. So. Well, that's, you know, it's certainly possible after, you know, that's enough time after the formation of the moon but for that to be possible. It's consistent with what you said is that you get these big impacts early on that melt the crust, but the crust solidifies yep. early. And so there's a possibility for liquid water back to 4.4. Absolutely. Means life could get going quite early. If the organics were there. You know, I'll talk about that. See, I don't think you need organics from elsewhere to make life. No, you need organic molecules. That's my point, John. You can't assume that the Earth came fully equipped with organic molecules because the Earth formed in an environment at 1 AU at 700 Kelvin where the amount of organics available uh, was probably very, very limited, if not zero. How are you defining organics, though, in this respect? Well, anything that contains uh, carbon, carbon okay. basically. So I'll agree that C1s are, are needed to come in. Yeah, that's right. So that's my point. It's not, it's not food for pre-existing organics. It's where do the organics actually come yeah, from? You need carbon. Yes, you need the carbon. Now, there are actually phases that are stable at 700 Kelvin. I mean, there's graphite. Um, there's gaseous CO2, but you can't trap the CO2. That's the problem. But if you can start life, you know, with some very refractory phase of organics, uh, a graphite or a kerogen or something, uh, then those could have been present in the one astronomical unit region. Diamond life. Yeah. Diamond life, yes. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, Ariel 26, mm -hmm. the have to consider where does it come from? So yes. And the usual explanation is the supernova explosion. Uh, can we make a detection, a detection between the explosion, the formation of uh, Ariel 26, and the one that we observe in, uh, for instance, in condensed spaces. So, so we, have, we are trying to date the, the formation of the solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, can we also uh, say how long this happened after the supernova explosion? OK. Um. To my knowledge, and I have to go back and check this, there is no way to know when, in an absolute, absolute way, when the supernova explosion occurred from the, uh, based on the aluminum 26. Um, and I'm not sure there are any other indicators either, except that uh, models tell you that if a supernova goes off uh, in a molecular cloud, that the compression and the formation of disks is greatly accelerated. Instead of a clump taking a million years to collapse, it could take a factor of 10 less than that, for example. Uh, even the collapse can be accelerated. But I, I'm not aware of any absolute date that can be put uh, or interval of time between the supernova explosion and the appearance of the first solids. But we can already uh, make a maximum uh, duration, assuming that the old aluminum yeah, well, that's a million years, basically. Uh, so, yes. But, okay, so certainly that you can say, because if the solids formed long after that, many half-lives after that, there wouldn't be enough aluminum-26 to have any thermal effects. Um, but that's still, I mean, millions of years is not a very tight time constraint, uh, right? I mean, there are other time constraints that, that do better than that. Um, you know, I mean, if you just say, okay, it's a a million years after the supernova explosion, there's still aluminum-26 around. And the question, of course, is always how much aluminum-26 was present. But... Um, we can also consider that uh, the aluminum-27 that you find, uh, well, is a mean... The ratio to carbon, oxygen, nitrogen is a mean one in, the, in our neighborhood. Yep. We should talk about this at dinner. I, Yes, that may be a way to do it, and I'm not actually sure the extent to which people have tried that. Okay. What, one more. There is one more. A very short question. Please. What is the estimate of the thickness of the matter 
deposited on the earth by the late heavy bombardment. Ah, well, I'll talk about that tomorrow. But um, to give you, uh, let's see, so to give you a sense of it, we're talking about the equivalent of 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 21 kilograms of material on the earth. To 10 to the 20 kilograms, basically. It's, um, if, as I'll argue tomorrow, it, it's, it's enough organics to be a respectable amount if you take the fraction of that that could be organics.